Last lesson, we looked at what random forests are, and we looked at some of the tweaks that we could use to make them work better. Um, uh, so in order to actually practice this, um, we needed to have a Jupyter Notebook environment running. Uh, so uh, we can either install Anaconda on our own computers, uh, we can use AWS, um, or we can use Cressel.com that has everything up and running straight away, um, or else Paperspace.com also works really well. Um, so assuming that you've got all that going, hopefully you've had a chance to practice running some random forests this week. I think one of the things to point out though is that before we did any tweaks of any hyperparameters or any tuning at all, uh, the raw defaults uh, already gave us a very good answer for an actual data set that we got off cattle. So like, the tweaks aren't always you know, the main piece, they're, they're just tweaks. Sometimes they're totally necessary. Um, um, but uh, quite often you can go a long way without doing many tweaks at all. So today we're going to look at something um, I think maybe even more important than building a predictive model that's good at predicting, which is to learn how to interpret that model to find out what it says about your data, to actually understand your data better by using machine learning. And this is um, kind of contrary to the, the common refrain that things like random forests are black boxes that hide meaning from us. And you'll see today that the truth is quite the opposite. Uh, the truth is that random forests allow us to understand our data deeper and more quickly uh, than traditional approaches. The other thing we're going to learn today is how to uh, look at larger data sets uh, than those which um, you can import with just the defaults. And specifically we're going to look at a data set with over 100 million rows which is the current uh, Kaggle competition for um, groceries forecasting. Did anybody have any questions outside of those two areas since we're covering that today, um, or comments that they wanted to talk about? Savannah? Yeah, I apologize. This is kind of like basic, just to make sure I'm understanding the concept. Make sure they can hear you. Oh, too. sorry. Um, can you just talk a little bit about, like, in general, I understand the details more now of a random forest, but like, yeah. When do you know this is an applicable model to use? Like, well, in general, I'll be like, oh, I should try a random forest here, because that's the part that I'm still like, yeah. if I'm told to, I can. But yeah. So the short answer is, um, I can't really think of anything offhand that it's definitely not going to be at least somewhat useful for, so it's always worth trying. Um, I think really the question is, in what situations should I try other things as well? Um, and the short answer to that question is, for unstructured data, what I call unstructured data, so where all the different data points represent the same kind of thing, like a, a, a waveform in a sound or speech, or the words in a piece of text, or the pixels in an image, uh, you almost certainly are going to want to try deep learning. Um, and then outside of those two there's a particular type of model we're going to look at today called a collaborative filtering model, where, um, which it so happens that the groceries competition is of that kind, where neither of those approaches are quite what you want without some tweaks to them. So that would be the, the other main one. Sorry, you're saying neither. Are you saying deep learning in random forests? Neither forest? deep learning or random forests is exactly what you want. You need to kind of do some tweaks. You'll see. Um, yeah, if anybody thinks of other places where maybe neither of those techniques is the right thing to use, um, yeah, mention it on the forums, even if you're not sure, you know, so we can talk about it, because I think this is one of the more interesting questions. And to some extent, it is a case of practice and experience, um, but I, I do think there are, you know, two main classes to know about. So. Last week, we, um, at the point where we had kind of done some of the key steps 
uh, you know, like the CSV reading in particular, which took you know a minute or two. At the end of that, we uh, saved it to a feather format file. And just to remind you, that's because this is uh, basically almost the same format that it lives in in RAM. So it's like ridiculously fast to read and write stuff from from feather format. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at lesson two RF interpretation. And the first thing we're going to do is read that feather format file. Um, now, one thing to mention is um, a couple of you pointed out during the week uh, a really interesting little little bug or little issue, which is um, in the procdf function. The procdf function, uh, remember. Um, finds the numeric columns which have missing values and creates an additional boolean column as well as replacing the missing with medians. Um, and um, uh, also turns the categorical objects you know, into, into the integer codes, um, the main things it does. And a couple of you pointed out some uh, key points about the missing value handling. The first one is that your test set uh, may have missing values in some columns that weren't in your training set or vice versa. And if that happens, you're going to get an error when you try to do the random forest because it's going to say, um, you know, if that is missing field appeared in your training set but not in your test set and it ended up in the model, um, it's going to say you can't use that uh, data set with this model because you're missing one of the columns it requires. Um, that's problem number one. Problem number two is that the median of the missing val uh, sorry the median of the numeric values in the test set may be different for the training set, and so it may actually process it into something which has different semantics. Um, so I thought that was a really interesting point. So what I did was I um, changed PropDF so it returns a third thing, um, NAs, um, and the NAs thing it returns, it doesn't matter in detail what it is, but I'll tell you just so you know, that's a dictionary that where the keys are the names of the columns that have missing values, and the values of the dictionary are the medians. And so then optionally you can pass NAs as an additional argument to PropDF, and it'll make sure that it adds those specific columns, and it uses those specific Medians. Okay, so it's kind of it's, it's it's giving you the ability to say process this test set in exactly the same way as we process this training set. Can you pass that, please? Hi, is this a updated feature? So you just updated yeah. So I just did that. Like, so we have to do get, the day before. So just yeah. the get pull. And yeah. Then... In fact, that's a good point. Um, before you start doing work, any day. I would start <laughs> doing a git pull, and if something's not working today that was was working yesterday, check the forum where there'll be an explanation of why. Uh, you know this um, this library in particular is moving fast, but pretty much all the libraries that we use, uh, including PyTorch in particular, move fast. And so one of the things to do if you're watching this uh, on uh, through the MOOC is to make sure that you go to course.fast.ai and check the links there because there'll be links saying, oh, these are the differences from the course. And so they're kind of kept up to date so that you're never going to, because I can't edit what I'm saying. <laughs> I can only edit that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, do a git pull before you start each day. Um, so I haven't actually updated um, all of the notebooks to add the extra uh, return value, I will over the next couple of days, but if you're using them, you'll just need to put an extra comma and a's here. Otherwise, you'll get an error that it's returned three things and you only have room for two things. Um, okay. What I want to do, I think what I want to do before I talk about interpretation is to show you what the exact same process looks like um, when you're working with a really large data set. Um, so, and you'll see it's kind of almost the same thing, but there's going to be a few cases where we can't use the defaults um, because the defaults kind of like just run a little bit too slowly. Right? So specifically I'm going to look at the um, 
Kaggle Groceries competition, specifically, what's it called? Here it is, Corporation Favorite Grocery Sales Forecasting. So um, this competition, um, uh, well, who's, who, who is entering this competition? Okay, a lot of you. Um, who would like to have a go at explaining what this competition involves, what, what the data is and what you're trying to predict? Okay, you're trying to uh, predict uh, the items on the shelf uh, depending on um, lots of factors like oil prices. What do you say, predicting the items on the shelf? What do you mean? What are you actually predicting? Um, how much they need to have in stock to maximize their, I guess. Uh, it's predict not quite what we're predicting, but that, we'll try and fix that yeah, in a moment. So okay, go on. Yeah. And then uh, there's a bunch of different data sets that you can use to do that. There's oil prices, there's uh, stores, there's locations, uh, and then each of those can be used to try to predict it. Okay. Does anybody want to have a go at expanding on that? Uh, All right. Uh, so we have a bunch of information on uh, different products. Uh, so we have uh, so for Let's every. Just up a little bit higher. Okay. Yeah. All right, so for uh, every store, uh, for every item, for every day, we have a lot of uh, uh, related information available, like the uh, uh, location where the store was uh, located, the class of the product, uh, and the uh, units sold. And then based on this, we are supposed to forecast in a much shorter time frame compared to the training data. For every item number, how much uh, we think uh, it's going to sell, so only the units. Uh, and nothing else. Okay, good. So can, somebody can help get that back here. So um, so your ability to explain the problem you're working on is really, really important. Okay, so if you don't currently feel confident of your ability to do that, practice, right, with someone who is not in, in this competition. Tell them all about it. So in this case, um, uh, or in any case really, the key things to understand a machine learning problem would be to say what are the independent variables and what is the dependent variable. So the dependent variable is the thing that you're trying to predict. The thing you're trying to predict is how many units of each kind of product were sold in each store on each day during a two week period. So that's the thing that you're trying to predict. And the information you have to predict it is how many units of each product at each store on each day were sold in the last few years, and for each store, some metadata about it, like where is it located and what class of store is it, for each type of product, you have some metadata about it, such as what category of product is it, and so forth, for each date, we have some metadata about it, such as what was the oil price on that date. So this is what we would call a relational data set. So a relational data set is one where we have a number of different pieces of information that we can join together. Specifically, this kind of relational database uh, data set is what we would refer to as a star schema. A star schema is a kind of data warehousing schema where we basically say there's some central transactions table. Now in this case, the central transactions table, if we go to the data section here, is train.csv, and it contains the number of units that were sold by date, by store ID, by item ID. Okay. So that's the central transactions table, very small, very simple. And then from that, we can join various bits of metadata. And it's called a star schema because you can kind of imagine the transactions table in the middle and then all these different metadata tables joined onto it, giving you more information about the date, the item ID, and the store ID. Okay? Sometimes you'll also see a snowflake schema which means there might then be additional information joined on to maybe the, um, the items table that tells you about different item categories, and store, joined to the store table telling you about the state that the store's in, and so forth. So you can have like a kind of a whole snowflake. Right? So um, that's the basic 
information about this problem. Okay, the the independent variables, the dependent variable, uh, and you probably also want something about like things like the time frame. Okay. Now we start in exactly the same way as we did before, loading in exactly the same stuff, setting the path. But when we go read CSV, if you say um, limit memory equals uh, false, right? Then you're basically saying use as much memory as you like to figure out what kinds of data is here. Um, it's going to run out of memory, um, pretty much regardless of how much memory you have. Um, so what we do in order to limit the amount of space that it takes up when we read it in is we create a dictionary for each column name to the data type of that column. Right? And so for you to create this, it's basically up to you to you know, run less or head or whatever on the data set to see what the types are uh, and to figure that out and pass them in. So then you can just pass in D type equals with that dictionary. And so check this out, right? We um, can read in the whole CSV file in 1 minute and 48 seconds. And there are 125.5 million rows. So like when people say like Python's slow, no Python's not slow. Python can be slow if you don't use it right, but we can actually parse 125 million CSV records in less than two minutes. Put my language hat on for just a moment. Uh, actually, if it's fast, almost certainly it's going to C. Right. Yeah. So Python is a wrapper around a bunch of C code usually. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so uh, yeah. So if Python itself isn't actually very fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was Terence Parr, who writes things for writing programming languages for a living. So and he is right. Um, Python itself is not fast, but almost everything we want to do in Python in data science has been written for us in C, or actually more often in Cython, which is a Python-like language which compiles to C. And so most of the stuff we run in Python is actually running not just C code, but actually in Pandas a lot of it's written in like assembly language, it's heavily optimized, behind the scenes a lot of that is going back to actually calling um, uh, Fortran-based uh, libraries for linear algebra. So there's layers upon layer of speed that actually allow us to spend less than two minutes reading in uh, that much data. Yeah, if we wrote our own CSV reader in pure Python, um, it would take it takes thousands of times, at least thousands of times longer than the um, optimized versions. Um, yeah, so for us, uh, what we care about is the speed we can get in practice. Um, and so this is pretty cool. Um, we, as well as telling it um, what the different data types were, we also have to tell it, uh, as before, which things do you want to parse as, as dates. Nice catch. I've noticed that in this dictionary you specify in 64, in 33, and in 8. I was wondering in practice, um, is it like faster if you all specify them to int or slower or like any performance consideration? So the key performance consideration here was to use the smallest number of bits that I could to fully represent the column. So if I had used n8 for item number, there are more than 255 item numbers. In fact, the, I mean more specifically the maximum item number is bigger than 255. So um, on the other hand, if I had used n64 for store number, it's using more bits than necessary. Uh, given that the whole purpose here was to avoid running out of RAM, um, we don't want to be using up eight times more memory than necessary. Um, so the key thing was really about memory, and in fact when you're working with large data sets, um, very often you'll find the slow piece is the actually reading and writing to RAM, not the actual CPU operations. So very often that's the key performance consideration. Um, also, however, um, as a rule of thumb, smaller data types often will run faster, um, particularly if you can use SIMD, so that's uh, single instruction multiple data vectorized code. It can pack more 
um, more uh, numbers into a single vector to run at once. Um, Thank you. Okay. Um, that was all heavily simplified and not exactly right, but uh, right enough, I think, for this purpose. Once you do this, uh, the shuffle thing beforehand is not needed anymore? Like when you do sand, a random subselection? Yeah, so, so although here I've read in the whole thing, um, when I start, I never start by reading in the whole thing. Um, so if you um, search the forum for, sh for shuff, uh, S-H-U-F, uh, you'll find some tips about how to use this Unix command to get a random sample of data um, at the command prompt. Um, and then you can just read that. And the nice thing is that that way, like that's a good way, for example, to find out what data types to use, you know, is to read in a random sample and let pandas figure it out for you. Um, oh, thank you. I think I'm still fine with this one. Though. Um, yeah, and in general, um, I do as much work as possible on a sample until I feel confident that I understand the sample before I move on. Uh, so, yeah. Um, having said that, um, what we're about to learn is some techniques for running models on this full data set that are actually going to work on arbitrarily large data sets. That also, I specifically wanted to talk about how to read in large data sets. Um, one thing to mention, on promotion object, objects are like, like saying create a general purpose Python data type which is slow and memory heavy. And the reason for that is that this is a boolean which also has missing values. And so we need to deal with this before we can turn it into a boolean. So you can see after that I then go ahead and I say fill in the missing values with false. Um, now you wouldn't just do this without doing some checking ahead of time, but some exploratory data analysis shows that it seems that this is probably an appropriate thing to do. It seems that missing does mean false. Um, it, uh, objects generally read in a string, so replace the strings true and false with actual booleans and then finally convert it to an actual boolean type. So at this point when I save this, um, this file now of uh, 123 million records takes up something under two and a half gigabytes of memory. So like you can do, like run, you know, look at pretty large data sets even on pretty small computers, um, which is interesting. So at that point, now that it's in a nice fast format, look how fast it is. I can save it to feather format in under five seconds. Okay, so that's nice. Um, and then because pandas is generally pretty fast, um, you can do stuff like summarize every column of all 125 million records in 20 seconds. Okay, so the first thing I looked at here actually is the dates. Right? Generally speaking, dates are just going to be really important in a lot of the stuff you do, particularly because any model that you put in in, in practice you're going to be putting it in at some date that is later than the date that you trained it, by definition. right? And so if anything in the world changes, you need to know how your predictive accuracy changes as well. And so what you'll see on Kaggle, and what you should always do in your own projects, is make sure that your dates don't overlap. So in this case, the dates that we have in the training set go from 2013 to mid-August 2017. Okay, there's our first and last. And then in our test set, they go from one day later, right, August the 16th, until the end of the month. So this is a key thing that, like, you can't really do any useful machine learning until you understand this basic piece here, which is you've got uh, four years of data, and you're trying to predict the next two weeks. Okay, so like that's just a fundamental thing that you're going to need to understand before you can really do a good job of this. And so, as soon as I see that, what does that say to you? If you wanted to now use a smaller data set, should you use a random sample, or is there something better you could do? Probably from the bottom, more recent? Yeah, get yeah. the most recent, right? And, and if you ever have trouble answering questions like this, just try to make it as physical as possible. So it's like, okay, um, I'm going to go to a shop next week and I'm, I've got a $5 bet with my brother as to whether I can guess how many cans of Coke are going to be on the shelf. Um, Alright, well probably the best way to do that would be to go to the shop 
same day of the previous week and see how many cans of Coke are on the shelf and guess it's going to be the same. You wouldn't go and look at how many were there four years ago. But couldn't four years ago that same time frame of the year be important? I mean, like for example, how much Coke they have on the shelf at Christmas time is going to be way more than... So exactly. So it's not that there's no useful information from four years ago. Um, uh, and so we don't want to entirely throw it away, but as a, as a first step, uh, like what was the, what's the simplest possible thing? It's kind of like submitting the means. I wouldn't submit the mean of 2012 sales, I would want to probably submit the mean of last month's sales, for example. Um, so yeah, we're just trying to think about like how might we want to kind of create some initial easy models and how, and later on like we might want to weight it. So, for example, we might want to weight more recent dates more highly, they're probably more relevant. Um, but we should do a whole bunch of exploratory data analysis to check that. So here's what the bottom of that data set looks like. Okay, um, And you can see literally it's got a date, a store number, an item number, and unit sales, and tells you whether or not that particular item was on sale uh, at that particular store on that particular date. And then there's some uh, arbitrary ID, right? So that's that's it. So now that we have read that in, we can do stuff like uh, take, uh, uh, this is interesting. Uh, again, we have to take the log of the sales, um, and it's the same reason as we looked at last week, right? Because we're trying to predict something that kind of varies according to ratios. Um, they told us in this in this competition that the root mean squared log error is the thing they care about, so we take a log. Um, they mentioned also, if you check the competition uh, details, which you always should read carefully the definition of any project you do, it's, they say that there are some negative sales that represent returns, and they tell us that we should uh, consider them to be zero for the purpose of this competition. So I clip the sales so that they fall between zero and no particular maximum. Okay, so clip just means cut it off at that point, truncate it, and then take the log of that plus one. Why do I do plus one? Because again, if you check the details of the capital competition, that's what they tell you they're going to use, is they're not actually just taking the root mean squared log error, but the root mean squared log plus one error. Okay, because log of zero doesn't make sense. Uh, we can add the date part as usual, and you know, again, it's taking a couple of minutes, right? So I would, I would run through all this on a sample first, so everything takes 10 seconds to make sure it works, just to check everything looks reasonable before I go back, because I don't want to wait two minutes for something I don't know it's going to work. Um, but as you can see, all, this, all these lines of code are identical to what we saw for the bulldozers competition. Um, in this case, I mean, all I'm reading in is a training set, I didn't need to run train cats because all of my data types are already numeric. Okay. Um, if they weren't, I would need to call train cats, and then I would need to call apply cats to apply the same categorical codes uh, that I now have in the training set to the validation set. Uh, I call prop df uh, as before um, to check for missing values and uh, so forth. Um, so all of those lines of code are identical. Uh, these lines of code again are identical um, because root mean squared error is still what we care about. Um, and then I've got two changes. The first is set RF samples, which we learned about last week. So we've got 120 something million records. Um, we probably don't want to create a tree from 120 million something records, right? I don't even know how long that's going to take. I haven't been, I haven't had the time and patience to wait and see. Um, so you know, you could start with 10,000 or 100,000. You know, maybe it runs in a few seconds, make sure it works, and you can kind of figure out how much you can run. And so I found getting it to a million, uh, it runs in under a minute. Right? And so the point here is there's no relationship between the size of the data set and how long it takes to build the random forest. The relationship is between the number of estimators multiplied by the sample size. Okay? Uh, yes. Um, just curious what n jobs is, because in the past it's always been negative one, and you made it eight here. Yeah, so the number of jobs is the number of cores that it's going to use. 
Um, and I was running this on a computer that has about 60 cores, and I just found if you try to use all of them, it spent so much time spinning up jobs, so it was a bit slower. So if you've got like lots and lots of cores on your computer, sometimes you want less than negative one means use every single core. Oh. Yeah. Um, there's one more change I made, which is that I converted the data frame into an array of floats, and then I fit it on that. Um, why did I do that? Um, because internally, inside the random forest code, they do that anyway, right? And so given that I wanted to run a few different random forests with a few different hyperparameters, by doing it once myself, I save that minute 37 seconds, right? So um, if you run a line of code and it takes like quite a long time. So the first time I ran this random forest regressor, it kind of took two or three minutes, and I thought, I don't really want to wait two or three minutes. Um, you can always add in front of the line of code p run, uh, percent p run. And what percent p run does is it runs something called a profiler. And what a profiler does is it'll tell you which lines of code behind the scenes took the most time. Right? And in this case, I noticed that there was a line of code inside scikit-learn that was this line of code, and it was taking all the time, nearly all the time. And so I thought, oh, I'll do that first, and then I'll pass in the result, and I won't have to do it again. Okay? So this thing of looking to see which things is taking up the time is called profiling, and in software engineering it's one of the most important tools you have. Uh, data scientists really underappreciate this tool, but you'll find like uh, amongst conversations on GitHub issues or on Twitter or whatever amongst the top data scientists, they're sharing and talking about profiles all the time. And that's how easy it is to get a profile. Um, so for fun, you know, try running PRUN from time to time on stuff that's taking 10, 20 seconds and see if you can learn to interpret and use uh, profiler outputs. You know, even though in this case, I didn't write this scikit-learn um, plus, I was still able to use the profile to figure out how to um, make it run uh, over twice as fast, right, by avoiding recalculating this each time. So in this case, uh, I built my regressor, I decided to use 20 estimators. Um, something else that I noticed in the profiler is that I can't use OOB score when I use set RF samples, because if I do, it's going to use the other 124 million rows to calculate the OOB score, which is like, again, it's still going to take forever. Uh, so I may as well have a proper validation set anyway. Besides which, I want a validation set that's the most recent dates rather than as random. So if you use set RF samples on a large data set, don't put the OOB score parameter in, because um, it takes forever. So that got me um, a 0.76 validation root mean squared log error. Uh, and then I tried like fiddling around at different min samples. So if I decrease the min sample sleep from 100 to 10, it took a little bit more time to run, as you would expect. And the um, error uh, went down from 76 to 71. So that looked pretty good. So I kept decreasing it down to 3. And that brought this error down to 0.70. Uh, when I decreased it down to one, uh, it didn't really help. So I kind of had like a reasonable random forest here. When I say reasonable, though, it's not reasonable in the sense that it's it's does not give a good result on the leaderboard. And so this is a very interesting question about why is that? And the reason is really coming back to Savannah's question earlier, like where might random forests not work as well. Let's go back and look at the data. Okay, here's the entire data set that we, well not the whole data set, here's all the columns that we used. So the columns that we have to predict with are they, the date, the store number, the item number, and whether it was on promotion or not. And then of course we used add date part, so there's also going to be day of week, day of month, day of year, is quarter, start, etc, etc. So, if you think about it, most of the insight, you know, around like how much of something do you expect to sell tomorrow, is likely to be very wrapped up in the details about like what, where is that store, 
what kind of things do they tend to sell at that store for that item? What category of item is, is it? You know, if it's like um, uh, fresh bread, they might not sell much of it on Sundays because on Sundays, you know, fresh bread doesn't get made. Um, where else is it's gasoline? Maybe they're going to sell a lot of gasoline because on Sundays people go and fill up their car for the week ahead, right? Now, a random forest has no ability to do anything other than create a bunch of binary splits on things like day of week, store number, item number. It doesn't know which one represents gasoline. It doesn't know which stores are in the center of the city versus which ones are out in the sticks. It doesn't know any of these things. So its ability to really understand what's going on is somewhat limited. So we're probably going to need to use the entire four years of data to even get some useful insights. But then as soon as we start using the whole four years of data, a lot of the data we're using is really old. So interestingly, um, there's a Kaggle kernel that points out that what you could do is just take the last two weeks and take the average sales, the average sales by date, by store number, by item number, and just submit that. And if you just submit that, you come about 30th. <laughs> All right. So, for those of you in the groceries, uh, Terence has a comment or a question. Actually, I think this may have tripped me up. Actually, uh, I think you said date, store, item. I think it's actually store, item, sales, and then you mean across date. Oh yeah, you're right. It's uh, store, item, and on promotion. Uh, on promotion, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, if you do it, if you do it by date as well, you end up. Um, so these, these, each row represents basically like a cross tabulation of all of the sales on that date in that store for that item. So if you put date in there as well, there's only going to be one or two um, items being averaged in each of those cells, which is you know too much variation. Basically, it's too sparse. Um, it doesn't give you a terrible result, but it's it's not thirtieth. Um, so. So your job, if you're looking at this competition, and we'll talk about this in the, in the next class, is how do you start with that model and make it a little bit better? Right? Because if you can, um, then by the time we meet up next, hopefully you'll be above the top 30. Because you know, Kaggle being Kaggle, lots of people have now taken this kernel and submitted it, and they all have about the same score. And the scores are ordered not just by score, but by date submitted. So if you now submit this kernel, you're not going to be 30th because you're way down the list of, of, of when it was submitted. Right? But if you can do a tiny bit better, you're going to be better than all of those people. So try and think of how can you make this a tiny bit better. Yes, I just... Uh, could you try to capture seasonality and trend effects by creating new columns like these are the average sales in the month of August, these are the average sales for this year? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. So the thing for you to think about is how to do that, right? And so like see if you can see if you can make it work. Because there are details to get right, which and I know Terence has been working on this for the last week and he's gone almost crazy. Right? But the details crazier. crazier. The details are are difficult. They're not difficult like intellectually difficult, they're kind of difficult in the way that makes you like want to headbutt your desk at 2am. Um, and like this is something to mention in general, is the coding you do for machine learning is like, it's incredibly frustrating and incredibly difficult, not difficult like technically, but difficult like there, if you get a detail wrong, much of the time it's not going to give you an exception. It'll just silently be slightly less good than it otherwise would have been. Right? And if you're on Kaggle, at least you know, okay, well I'm not doing as well as other people on Kaggle. Right? But if you're not on Kaggle, you just don't know. Like You don't know if your company's model is like half as good as it could be, because you made a little mistake. Right? So that's why one of the reasons why practicing on Kaggle now is great, right? Because you're going to get practice in finding all of the ways 
in which you can infuriatingly screw things up. Right? And you'll be amazed. Like for me, there's an extraordinary array, array of them. But as you get to know what they are, you'll start to know how to check for them as you go. Right? And so the only way, like you should assume every button you press, you're going to press the wrong button. Right? And that's fine as long as you have a way to find out. Okay, so um, we'll talk about that more you know, during the course, but unfortunately there isn't like a set of specific things I can tell you to always do. You just always have to think like, okay, what do I know about the results of this thing I'm about to do? I'll give you a really simple example. Just a moment. I'll give you a really simple example. If you've actually created that that basic entry entry where you do take the mean by date by store number by on promotion right and you've like submitted it and you've got a reasonable score and then you think you've got something that's a little bit better and you do predictions for that how about you now create a scatter plot showing the predictions of your average model on one axis versus the predictions of your new model on the other axis you should see that they just about form a line Right? And if they don't, then that's a very strong suggestion that you've screwed something up. Right? So that would be an example. Okay, can you pass that one to the end of that row? Possibly two steps. One step now. Yeah, so, you hear, so for a problem like this, um, unlike the car insurance problem on Kaggle where we don't, where columns are unnamed, we know, uh, we, we know what the columns represent and what they are. Do you? Uh, how often do you pull in data from other sources um, to supplement that? I mean, you could maybe like weather data, or you know, for example, or, or how often is that used? Very often, right? And so the whole point of this um, star schema is that you've got your central table, and then you've got these other tables coming off it that provide metadata about it. So, for example, weather is metadata about a date, right? Now, on Kaggle specifically, most competitions have the rule that you can use external data as long as you post on the forum that you're using it and that it's publicly available. Um, but you have to check on a competition by competition basis, they will tell you. Um, outside of Kaggle, you should always be looking for like, what external data could I possibly leverage here? All right. Yes, because otherwise they can't hear on the recording. Okay. So, are we still talking about how to tweak this data set? If you wish. Um, well, I'm not familiar with the countries here, so maybe this is Ecuador. Ecuador. So maybe I would. It's Ecuador's largest grocery chain. Ecuador's largest grocery chain. Maybe I would start looking for Ecuador's holidays. And shopping holidays, maybe when they have a three-day weekend or a week yeah. off. Yeah, and actually, that information is provided um, uh, in this case. And so, in, in general, um, one way of tackling this kind of um, problem is to create lots and lots of new columns containing things like, you know, average number of sales on holidays, uh, average percent change in sale between January and February, and so on and so forth. And so. Um, if you have a look at, there's been a previous competition on Kaggle um, called Rossmann Store Sales that was almost identical. Uh, it was uh, in Germany in this case for a major grocery chain. How many items are sold by day by item type by store? And the uh, in this case, the person who won, uh, quite unusually actually, was something of a domain expert in this space. Uh, they're actually a specialist in doing. Um, logistics predictions, and this is basically what they did was, he's a professional sales forecast consultant, um, he, um, he created just lots and lots and lots of columns based on his experience of what kinds of things tend to be useful for making predictions. Okay, so that, that, that's an approach that can work. Um, the third place team did almost no feature engineering. However, and also they uh, had one big oversight, which I think they would have won if they hadn't had it. So you don't necessarily have to use this approach. Um, so we'll be learning anyway. We'll be learning a lot more about how to win this competition um, and ones like it as we go.
They did interview the third place team. So if you Google for um, Kaggle, Rossman, you'll see it. Uh, the short answer is they used deep learning. Um, so one of the things, and these are a couple of charts that, um, so Terence is actually my teammate on this competition. So Terence um, drew a couple of these charts for us, and I wanted to talk about this, which is if you don't have a good validation set, um, it's, it's hard, if not impossible, to create a good model. So in other words, like if you're trying to predict next month's sales and you build a bunch, you know, you try to build a model and you have no way of really knowing whether the models you built are good at predicting sales a month ahead of time, then you have no way of knowing when you put your model in production whether it's actually going to be any good. Right? So, so you need a validation set that you know is reliable at telling you whether or not your model is likely to work well when you like put it into production or use it on the test set. So in this case, um, what Terence has plotted here is, and so normally you should not use your test set for anything other than using it right at the end of the competition or right at the end of the project to find out how you've gone. But there's one thing I'm going to let you use the test set for in addition, and that is to calibrate your validation set. So what Terence did here was he built four different models, right? some which he thought would be better than others, and he submitted each of the four models to Kaggle to find out its score. And so the x-axis is the score that Kaggle told us on the leaderboard. Okay. And then on the y-axis he plotted the score on a particular validation set he was trying out to see whether this validation set looked like it was going to be any good. Okay. So if your validation set is good, then the relationship between the leaderboard score, i.e. the test set score, and your validation set score should lie in a straight line. Ideally, it will actually lie on the y equals x line. Okay? But honestly, that doesn't matter too much. As long as, relatively speaking, it tells you which models are better than which other models, then you know which model is the best. Okay? Uh, and you know how it's going to perform on the test set because you know the linear relationship between the two things. Okay? So in this case, Terence has managed to come up with a validation set which is looking like it's going to predict our Kaggle leaderboard score pretty well. And that's really cool, right? Because now he can go away and try a hundred different types of models, feature engineering, weighting, tweaks, hyperparameters, whatever else, see how they go in the validation set and not have to submit to Kaggle, right? So we're going to get a lot more iterations, a lot more feedback. Right? This is not just true of Kaggle, but every machine learning project you do. Yeah? And so if you find, so here's a different one he tried, right, where it wasn't as good, right? It's like, oh, these ones that were quite close to each other, it's showing us the opposite direction, that's a really bad sign. So it's like, okay, this validation set idea didn't seem like a good idea, this validation set idea didn't look like a good idea. And so in general, if your validation set's not showing a nice straight line, you need to think carefully, like, okay, how is the test set constructed? Why, how is my validation set different? You know, there's some way you're constructing it which is, which is different. You're going to have to draw lots of charts and so forth. So one question is, uh, and I'm going to try to, to guess how, how you did it. So how do you actually try to construct this validation set as close to the... So what I would try to do is to try to sample points from the training set that are very closer as possible to some of the points in the test set. Close in what sense? Uh, I don't know. I will have to find the features. Um, well, in this case, for this groceries. For it, this groceries, um, the last points? Yeah, close by date. Yeah. Um, so basically date. all the different things Terence was trying were different variations of Something close like by date. So the most recent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, <clears throat> what I noticed was, so first I looked at the date range of the test set. And then I looked at the uh, the kernel that described how so he or she... So here's the date range of the test set, so the last two weeks of August 26, 2017. That's right, and then the person who submitted the kernel that said how to get the 0.58 leaderboard position or whatever yeah, score... the average by group. Yeah. I looked at the date range of that, and um, 
That was, was like nine or ten days. Right? Well, it was actually 14 days, 14. and the test set is 16 days. Okay. But the interesting thing is the test set begins on the day after payday and ends on the payday. Ah. And so these are things I also paid attention to. Mm. Uh, but And I think the, that's one of the bits of metadata that they told us, you know. So yeah. these are the kinds of things you just got to, like, try. Like I said, try, plot lots of pictures. And, like, even if you didn't know it was payday, you know, you would want to, like, draw the time series chart of sales, and you would hopefully see that, like, every two weeks there would be a spike or whatever. And you'd be like, oh, I want to make sure that my... I have the, the same number of spikes in my validation set that I've had in my test set, for example. Okay, let's take a five minute break and uh, let's come back at uh, 2.32. Okay, so um, this is my favorite bit, uh, interpreting machine learning models. Um, and by the way, um, if you're looking for my notebook about the groceries competition, you won't find it in GitHub because I'm not allowed to share uh, code for running competitions with you unless you're on the same team as me. Um, that's the rule. Uh, after the competition is finished, it'll be on GitHub, however, so if you're doing this through the video, you should be able to find it. Um, so let's start by reading in our feather file. So our feather file is exactly the same as uh, our CSV file. This is for our blue book for bulldozers competition. So we're trying to predict the sale price of heavy industrial equipment at auction. Um, and so reading the feather format file means that we've already um, read in the CSV and processed it into categories. Um, and so the next thing we do is to run procdf in order to turn the categories into integers, deal with the missing values, and pull out the dependent variable. Okay, uh, This is exactly the same thing as we used last time to create a validation set, where the validation set represents the last uh, couple of weeks, the last 12,000 records um, by date. And uh, I discovered, um, thanks to one of your excellent questions on the forum last week, I had a, a bug here. Um, which is that um, um, procdf was um, shuffling uh, the order, sorry, um, ah, sorry, not procdf. Uh, and last week we saw a particular version of procdf where we passed in a subset, uh, and when I passed in the subset it was randomly shuffling, and so then when I said split vowels, it wasn't getting the last rows by date, but it was getting a random set of rows. So I've now fixed that. So if you rerun um, the Lesson 1 RF code, you'll see slightly different results. Uh, specifically, you'll see in that section that my validation set uh, results look less good. Uh, but that's only for this tiny little bit where I had subset equals uh, set. Yes, Chenchi. Um, I'm a little bit confused about the notation here. So NAS is both a input variable and it's also the output variable of mm. this function. And yeah. Why is that? The uh, procdf returns a dictionary telling you um, which things were missing, which columns were missing, uh, and for each of those columns what the median was. Um, so when you uh, call it on uh, like the larger data set, the non-subset, um, you want to take that return value, right, and you don't pass in uh, an NAD to that point. You just want to get back the result. Later on, when you pass it into a subset, you want to use the, have the same missing columns and the same medians, and so you pass it in. And if, like, this different subset, uh, like if it was a whole different data set, turned out it had some different missing columns, it would update that dictionary with some uh, with additional key values as well. So it kind of you can you don't have to pass it in. If you don't pass it in, then it just gives you gives you the information about what was missing and, and the medians. If you do pass it in, it uses that information for uh, any missing columns that that are there. And if there are some new missing columns, it'll update that dictionary with that additional information. 
So it's like keeping、um, all data sets,、uh, column information. Yeah, it's going to keep track of all any any missing columns that you came across in any of anything you passed across. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we split it into the training and test set, just like we did last week. And so to remind you, once we've done Prop DF, this is what it looks like. This is the log of sale price. Okay. So the first thing to think about is、um, we already know how to get the predictions, right? Which is we take the uh, average, uh, we take the average value in each leaf node in each tree. Uh, after running a particular row through each tree, right? That's how we get the the prediction. But normally we don't just want a prediction.、Uh, we also want to know how confident we are of that prediction. And so we would be less confident of a prediction if we haven't seen many examples of rows like this one. And if we haven't seen many examples of rows like this one, then we wouldn't expect any of the trees. To kind of have a path through, which which is really designed to help us predict that row, and so conceptually, you would expect then that as you pass this unusual row through different trees, it's kind of going to end up in very different places. So in other words, rather than just taking the mean of the predictions of the trees and saying that's our prediction, what if we took the standard deviation? Of the predictions of the trees, so the standard deviation of the predictions of the trees, if that's high, that means each tree is giving us a very different estimate of this row's prediction. So if this was a really common kind of row, right, then the trees will have learnt. To make good predictions for it, because it's seen lots of opportunities to split based on those kinds of rows.、Right? So the standard deviation of the predictions across the trees gives us some kind of at least relative understanding of how confident we are of this prediction. So that is not something which exists. In Scikit-Learn or in any library I know of,、uh, so we have to create it. But we already have almost the exact code we need because remember last lesson we actually manually calculated the averages across different sets of trees, so we can do exactly the same thing to calculate the standard deviations. So when I'm doing random forest interpretation, I pretty much never use the full data set. I always call set RF samples because like. We don't need a massively accurate random forest. We just need one which indicates the nature of the relationships involved, right? And so I just make sure this number is high enough that if I call the same interpretation commands multiple times, I don't get different results back each time. That's like the rule of thumb about how big does it need to be, right? But in practice, like fifty thousand is a high number, and most of the time. You know, it would be surprising if that wasn't enough, right? And and it runs in seconds. So I generally start with fifty thousand. So with my fifty thousand samples per tree set, I create forty estimators. I know from last time that min samples leaf equals three, max features equals point five isn't bad. And again, we're not trying to create the world's most predictive tree anyway.、Um, so that all sounds fine.、Um, we get an R squared on the validation set of point eight nine. Again. We don't particularly care, but it's as long as it's good enough, which it certainly is.、Um, and so here's where we can do that exact same list comprehension as last time. Remember, go through each estimator, that's each tree, call dot predict on it with our validation set, make that a list comprehension, and pass that to np dot stack, which concatenates everything in that list across a new axis. Okay. So now our rows are the results of each tree, and our columns are the result of each row in the original data set. And then we remember we can calculate the mean, right? So here's the prediction for、uh, our data set row number one, and here's our standard deviation. Okay, so here's how to do it for just one、uh, observation、right? at the end here.、Um, we've calculated for all of them, just printing it for one here. Now. This 
Um, this can take quite a while, and specifically, it's not taking advantage of the fact that my computer has lots of cores in it. Um, list comprehensions. This is this is like the list comprehension itself is Python code, right? It's my Python code, and Python code, unless you're doing special stuff, runs in serial, which means it, it runs on a single CPU. It doesn't take advantage of your multi CPU hardware. And so, if I wanted to run this, you know, on, on more trees and more data, you know, this um, one second is going to go up. And you see here the wall time, the amount of actual time it took, is roughly equal to the CPU time. Where else, if it was running on lots of cores, the CPU time would be higher than the wall time. So it turns out that um, uh, Scikit-Learn provides a handy, uh, actually not Scikit-Learn, uh, FastAI provides a handy uh, function called Parallel Trees, which calls some stuff inside Scikit-Learn. And Parallel Trees takes two things. It takes a random forest model that I trained. So here it is, M. And some function to call, and it calls that function on every tree in parallel. So, in other words, rather than calling t dot predict x valid, let's create a function that calls t dot predict x valid. Let's use parallel trees to call it on our model for every tree. Okay, and it will return a list of the result of applying that function to every tree. And so then we can np dot stack that. So hopefully you can see that that code and that code are basically the same thing, right? But this one is doing it in parallel, and so you can see here now um, our um, wall time has gone down to uh, 500 milliseconds, um, and it's now uh, giving us exactly the same answer. Okay, so a little bit faster. Um, Time permitting, we'll talk about more general ways of, of writing code that runs in parallel, because it turns out to be super useful for data science. Um, but here's one that we can use that's very specific to random forests. Um, okay, so what we can now do is we can always call this to get our um, predictions for each tree, and then we can call standard deviation to then get them for every row. Um, and so let's try using that. So what I could do is let's create a copy of our data, and let's add an additional column to it, which is the standard deviation of the predictions across the first axis. Okay, um, and let's also add in the mean. So they're the predictions themselves. Um, so we, you might remember from last lesson that one of the uh, predictors. Um, we have is called enclosure, uh, and we'll see later on that this is an important predictor. Um, and so let's start by just doing a histogram. So one of the nice things in pandas is it's got built-in plotting capabilities. Uh, it's well worth googling for pandas plotting to see how to do it. Uh, yes, Terence. Jeremy, can you remind me what enclosure is? Uh, so we don't know uh, what it means. Uh, and it doesn't matter, you know, like that's the whole purpose of this process is that we're going to figure out We're going to learn about what things are or at least what things are important and we'll later on figure out what they are and how they're important So we're going to start out knowing nothing about this data set, right? So there's something so I'm just going to look at something called enclosure that has something called EROPS and something called OROPS And I don't even know what this is yet. All I know is that the only three that really appear in any great quantity are OROPS EROPS, WAC, and EROPS. And this is like really common as a data scientist, you know, you often find yourself looking at data that you're not that familiar with, and you've got to figure out at least like which bits to study more carefully and which bits seem to matter and so forth. So in this case, I at least know that these three groups I really don't care about because they basically don't exist. Um, so given that, we're going to ignore those three. So we're going to focus on this one here, this one here, and this one here. And so here you can see what I've done is I've taken um, my uh, data frame uh, and I've uh, grouped by enclosure, and I am taking the average of these three fields. So here you can see here's the average sale price, the average prediction, and the standard deviation of prediction for each of my three groups. So I can already start to 
learn a bit here. Um, as you would expect, the uh, prediction and the sale price are close to each other on average, so that's a good sign. Um, and then the standard deviation varies a little bit. It's a little hard to see in a table, uh, so what we could do is um, we could try to start like printing these things out. Uh, so here we've got um, the sale price for each level of enclosure, and here we've got the prediction for each level of enclosure, and for the error bars I'm using the standard deviation of prediction. All right, so here you can see the actual, and here's the prediction, and here's my confidence interval. Okay. Um, or at least it's the average of the standard deviation of the random forests. So this tells us, it'll tell us if there's some groups or some rows that we're not very confident of at all. Um, so we could do something similar for product size. right? So here's different product sizes. Uh, we can do exactly the same thing of looking at our predictions and our standard deviations. Okay, we could sort by, and what we could say is like, well, what, what's the uh, ratio of the standard deviation of the predictions to the predictions themselves? Right? So you would kind of expect on average that when you're predicting something that's a bigger number that your standard deviation would be higher. Right? So you can like sort by that ratio. And what that tells us is that the product size large and product size compact, our predictions are less accurate, you know, as relatively speaking, as a ratio of the total price. And so then if we go back and have a look, well there you go, that's why. From the histogram, those are the smallest groups. Okay, so as you would expect, in small groups we're doing a less good job. Right? So this confidence interval you can really use for two main purposes. One is that you can group it up like this and look at the average confidence interval by group to find out are there some groups that you just don't seem to have confidence about, about those groups, but perhaps more importantly you can look at them for specific rows, and so when you put it in production you might always want to see the confidence interval. So if you're doing, say, credit scoring, so deciding whether to give somebody a loan, you probably want to see not only what's their level of risk, but how confident are we. And if they want to borrow lots of money and we're not at all confident or about our ability to predict whether they'll pay it back, we might want to give them a smaller loan. Okay, so those are the two ways in which you would use this. Okay, let me go to the next one, which is the most important. Uh, the most important is feature importance. Um, and the only reason I didn't do this first is because I think the intuitive understanding of how to calculate confidence interval is the easiest one to understand intuitively. In fact, it's almost identical to something we've already calculated. Right? But in terms of which one do I look at first in practice, I always look at this in practice. So when I'm working on whether it be a cattle competition or a real world uh, project, um, I build a random forest as fast as I can, um, uh, try and get it to the point that it's like, you know, significantly better than random, but it doesn't have to be much better than that. And then the next thing I do is to plot the feature importance. And the feature importance tells us in this random forest which columns mattered. Right? So we had like dozens and dozens of columns originally in this data set, and here I'm just picking out the top 10. So you can just call RF feature importance, again this is part of the FastAI library, it's leveraging stuff that's in scikit-learn, pass in the model, pass in the data frame, because we need to know the names of the columns, right? and it'll tell you, uh, it'll order, uh, give you back a pandas data frame showing you in order of importance uh, how important was each column, and here I'm just going to pick out the top 10. So we can then plot that, right? so fi um, because it's a data frame, we can use data frame plotting commands. So here I've plotted all of the feature importances, right? And so you can see here, like, and I, I haven't been able to write all of the names of the columns at the bottom, which that's not the important thing. The important thing is to see that some columns are really, really important, and most columns don't really matter at all. And like in nearly every data set you use in real life, this is what your feature importance 
is going to look like. It's going to say there's like a handful of columns that you care about. And this is why I always start here, right? Because at this point, in terms of like looking into learning about this domain of heavy industrial equipment auctions, I only going to care about learning about the columns which matter, right? So are we going to bother learning about enclosure? Depends whether enclosure is important. And there it is. It's in the top 10. So we are going to have to learn about enclosure. Okay? So then we could also plot this as a bar plot. Right? So you can hear I've just created a little, a little tiny little function here that's going to just plot um, my bars. Um, and I'm just going to do it for the top 30. And so you can see the same basic shape here. Uh, and I can see there's my enclosure. Okay, so we're going to learn about how this is calculated in just a moment. Um, but before we worry about how it's calculated, much more important is to know what to do with it. So the most important thing to do with it is to now sit down with your client or your data dictionary or whatever your source of information is and say to them, okay, tell me about year made. What does that mean? Where does it come from? Um, plot lots of things like histograms of year made and scatter plots of year made against price and learn everything you can because year made and coupler system, they're the things that matter, right? And what will often happen in real world projects is that you'll sit with the client and you'll say, oh, it turns out the coupler system is the second most important thing, and then they might say, that makes no sense. Now that doesn't mean that there's a problem with your model. It means there's a problem with their understanding of the data that they gave you. Right? So let me give you an example. Um, I entered a Kaggle competition where the goal was to predict which applications for grants at a university would be successful. And I used this exact approach, and I discovered a number of columns which were almost entirely predictive of the dependent variable. And specifically, when I then looked to see in what way they were predictive, it turned out that whether they were missing or not was basically the only thing that mattered in this data set. And so later on, so I ended up winning that competition, and I think a lot of it was thanks to this insight. Right? And so later on, I heard what had happened, and it turns out that at that university, there's, you know, there's an administrative burden to filling out the database. And so for a lot of the grant applications, they don't fill in the database for the folks whose applications weren't accepted. Right? So in other words, these missing values in the data set were saying, okay, this grant wasn't accepted, because if it was accepted, then you know the admin folks are going to go in and, and type in that information. So this is what we call data leakage. And data leakage means there's information in the data set that I was modeling with, which the university wouldn't have had in real life at the point in time they were making a decision. Right? So when they're actually deciding, you know, um, which grant applications should I like prioritize, um, they don't actually know which ones the admin staff are later on going to add information to because it turns out that they got accepted. You see what I mean? Right? So one of the key things you'll find here is, is data leakage problems, and that's a, a serious problem that you need to deal with. Um, the other thing that will happen is you'll often find it's signs of collinearity. And I think that's what's happened here with coupler system. I think coupler system tells you whether or not a particular kind of heavy industrial equipment has a particular feature on it. Um, but if it's not that kind of industrial equipment at all, it will be empty, it will be missing. And so coupler system is really telling you whether or not it's a certain class of heavy industrial equipment. Now this is not leakage, this is actual information you actually have at the right time. It's just that like interpreting it you have to be careful. Okay? Um, so I would go through at least the top 10 or like kind of look for where the natural breakpoints are and really study these things carefully. Um, to make life easier for myself, what I tend to do is I try to throw some data away and see if that matters. So in this case, I had a um, random forest which, let's go and see how accurate it was. Uh, 0.89, um, what I did was I said here, okay, well let's go through our feature importance data frame and filter out those where the importance is greater than 
right? So 0.025, so 0 0.005 is about here, right? It's kind of like where they really flatten off. Right? So let's just keep those. Um, and so that gives us uh, a list of 25 column names. And so then I say, okay, let's now create a new uh, data frame view which just contains those 25 columns. Um, call split vowels on it again, just put it into test and training set, and um, create a new random forest. And let's see what happens. And you can see here the uh, R squared basically didn't change. Uh, 891. versus 889. So it's actually increased a tiny bit, right? I mean, generally speaking, removing uh, redundant columns, uh, well, you know, it, it shouldn't, obviously it shouldn't make it worse. If it makes it worse, they weren't redundant after all. Um, it might make it a little better, because if you think about how we built these trees, um, when it's deciding what to split on, you know, it's it's got less things to have to worry about trying, it's less often going to like accidentally find a crappy column. Uh, so it's you know got a slightly better opportunity to create a slightly better tree with slightly less data, but it's you know it's not going to change it by much. Um, but it's going to make it a bit faster, and it's going to let us focus on what matters. So if I rerun feature importance now, um, I've now got 25. Now the key thing that's happened is that when you remove redundant columns, is that you're also removing sources of collinearity. Right? In other words, two columns that might be related to each other. Now, collinearity doesn't make your random forest less predictive, but if you have two columns that are related to each other, you know, uh, you know, like this column is a little bit related to this column, and this column is a strong driver of the dependent variable, then what's going to happen is that the, the importance is going to end up like kind of split between the two collinear columns. It's going to say like, well, both of those columns matter, so kind of, it's going to split it between the two. So by removing some of those columns with very little impact, it makes your feature importance plot clearer. And so you can see here actually, year made was pretty close to coupler system before, but there must have been a bunch of things that were collinear with year made, which makes perfect sense, right? Like old industrial equipment wouldn't have had a bunch of kind of technical features that new ones would, for example. So it's actually saying like, oh, okay, year made really, really matters, right? So I trust this feature importance better. You know, the predictive accuracy of the model is a tiny bit better, but this feature importance has a lot less collinearity to confuse us. So let's talk about how this works. And it's actually really simple. And not only is it really simple, it's a technique you can use j not just for random forests, but for um, basically any kind of machine learning model. Um, and interestingly, almost no one knows that. Um, like many people will tell you, oh, this particular kind of model, there's no way of like interpreting it. And the most important interpretation of a model is knowing like which things are important. Um, and that's almost certainly not going to be true, because this technique I'm going to teach you actually works for any kind of model. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take our data set, the bulldozers, right, and we've got this column which we're trying to predict, right, which is price. And then we've got all of our independent variables. Okay, so here's an independent variable here, year made, right, plus a whole bunch of other variables. And remember, we had after we did a bit of trimming, we had 25 independent variables. Okay, how do we figure out how important year made is? Well, we've got our whole random forest, right? And we can find out our predictive accuracy. Where so we're going to put all of these rows through our random forest, and we're going to spit out some predictions. Right? And we're going to compare them to the actual price you get, in this case, for example, our root mean squared error and our R squared. And we're going to call that, like, that's our starting point. Right? So now, let's do exactly the same thing, but let's take the year made column and randomly shuffle it. So randomly permute just that column. So now, year made has exactly the same like distribution as before, same mean standard deviation, 
but it's going to have no relationship to the dependent variable at all because we totally randomly reordered it. So before we might have found our R squared was 0.89, right? And then after we shuffle year made, we check again, and now it's like 0.8. Like, oh, our score got much worse when we destroyed that variable. And it's like, okay, let's try again. Let's put year made back to how it was. And this time, let's take enclosure and shuffle that. Right? And we find this time with enclosure, it's 0.84. And we can say, oh, okay, so the amount of decrease in our score for year made was 0.09, and the amount of decrease in our score for enclosure was 0 0.05. Right? And this is going to give us our feature importances for each one of our columns. Yes. Um, wouldn't just excluding, let's say, each column and running running a random forest and checking the uh, decay in the performance? Yeah. So be... um, you could remove the column and train a whole new random forest, but that's going to be really slow. Whereas this way we can keep our random forest and just test the predictive accuracy of it again. Mm. Right, so this is nice and fast by comparison. In this case, we just have to rerun every row forward through the forest um, for each shuffled column. I see. We, we're just basically doing predictions after Exactly. Okay. Yeah, great question. Um, so if you want to do like multicoloniality, would you do two of them and then random shuffle and then three of them random shuffle? Like that yeah, so I mean, I don't think you mean multicollinearity, I think you mean looking for interaction effects. Okay. Yeah, so if you want to say uh, which pairs of variables are most important, you could do exactly the same thing uh, each pair in, in turn. Um, in practice, there are better ways to do that, um, because that's obviously computationally pretty expensive, and so we'll try and find time to do that if we can. Okay. So we now have a model which is a little bit more accurate, um, and uh, is, we've learned a lot more about it. Um, so we're out of time, and so um, what I would suggest you try doing now, uh, uh, before the next class, uh, for this bulldozer's data set, is like go through the top, I don't know, five or ten predictors, and um, try and learn what you can about how to draw plots in pandas, and try to come back with like some insights about like what's the relationship between year made and the dependent variable, what's the histogram of year made. You know, try and find you know some possible like now that you know year made is really important. Is there some noise in that column which we could fix? Are there some weird encodings in that column that we could fix? Um, this idea I had that maybe couple system is there entirely because it's collinear with something else. Do you want to like try and figure out whether that's true? If so, how would you do it? Um, FI product class desk. That rings alarm bells for me. It sounds like it might be a high cardinality categorical variable. It might be something with lots and lots of levels because it sounds like it's like a model name. So like. Go and have a look at that model name. Does it have some ordering to it? Could you make it an ordinal variable to make it better? Does it have some kind of hierarchical structure in the string that we could split it on, like hyphen, to create more subcolumns? You know, have a think about this. You know, and and so try and make it so that you know by Tuesday when you come back, you've got some new. Ideally, you've got a, a better accuracy than what I just showed because you found some new insights, uh, or at least that you can tell the class about some things you've learnt about how heavy industrial equipment options work in practice. Okay? Great. See you on Tuesday. <laughs>